so pleased to be with you here at UCF to talk about water and Florida's future, especially with the numbers of students in the audience. I think you'll agree with me that one of the best things about growing up in Florida is the water. As you just heard, everywhere you look, there seems to be a water playground, right? Uh, idyllic beaches on three sides, rivers and streams flowing for tens of thousands of miles, 8,000 lakes, and more than 1,000 freshwater springs now identified. This bounty makes it hard to fathom that Florida's water is in any sort of trouble. I'm going to show you this morning that our water is indeed in trouble, and throughout the day, you'll hear from some of the most thoughtful water minds in Florida about what to do, management answers, political answers, legal answers. But the most important people in the room today are not those of us on the program. The most important people in the room are you students in the audience. That's because there really is only one solution that will ensure Florida's water future is as rich as you found it in your childhoods, and that is the idea of a new ethic for water, a transformation in the way we live with water in every sector of our economy and our culture. The second part of my talk is going to describe this ethic and how easy it would be for us to live differently. My generation has made some headway, but it is difficult to change the dominant view of water, which is as old as Florida statehood. I will start with those old ideas, not yet history. I am convinced that your generation is the one that will make them so. So I guess this, we're not going to get any dimmer than this, I guess. I hope you can see these slides okay. So my first book, Mirage, told the ironic tale of vanishing water in one of the wettest states. We in Florida get more rainfall than all but one other state, an average 54 inches a year. And at statehood in 1845, the entire peninsula was half submerged. So the Cliff's notes for Mirage are that we set out to get rid of water and we got rid of too much. In the 19th century, we perfected the art of draining swampland, right? We've drained a total 11 million acres of wetlands statewide, not realizing in time how much we would come to miss the many roles of wetlands to the health of our ecosystems and ourselves to name just a few wetlands clean, dirty water. They store our fresh water and they keep us safe from floodwaters. <clears throat> In the 20th century, we became really good at pumping groundwater up from the Floridan aquifer. The Floridan is one of the most prodigious sources of groundwater in all the world, flowing through limestone cracks and channels under most of Florida, southern Georgia, and bits of South Carolina, Alabama, and Mississippi. It provides most of our drinking water. And this aquifer also feeds the Thousand Springs. I mentioned the largest concentration of freshwater springs anywhere in the world. Now, I've really come to see the springs as our windows into the health of our fresh waters, our canary in the coal mine, if you will. And this and other springs photos I'm about to show you are by my talented photographer friend, John Moran. They're also part of an exhibit that opens next month called Springs Eternal, which will give Floridians a quite shocking look at how our springs have changed in the 30 years that John has been shooting the springs. So the springs have always been subject to Florida's natural cycle of drought and flood, but beginning in the 1950s, human withdrawals meant that some began to dry up and never come back. This is the former spa and resort at a once vibrant tourist destination called White Springs. It was one of Florida's largest springs, a first magnitude. 
This is what it looks like today. It dried up in the early 70s due to groundwater pumping and flowed for the last time in the 90s. I've always thought John's shot of Peacock Springs perfectly captured where Peacock got its name. You can see here what led William Bartram to describe our spring waters as blue ether of another world. But now, today, Peacock Blue is an algal brown soup. <clears throat> I keep a running list of lost springs on my computer, that is, springs that can no longer be used by the public for whatever reason. I counted them yesterday before I left home, and the number was 39. Last year, I had a really disheartening assignment, <clears throat> and that was to give the dedication speech for a historic marker to a dead spring called Kissingen here in central Florida. I hiked through the dry spring, spring bed with these elderly Floridians who had done cannonballs into its chilly waters in their youth. So imagine if you uh, become an elderly Floridian someday and you look back at the places you played in your youth and they, and they were gone. That was a really poignant day. Of course, our state is not isolated. Nationwide, freshwater habitats have become the single most degraded of all America's major ecosystems. And there is no single culprit here. Rather, what happens to our water is a direct result of the way we use water. Everything we do, flood control, power production, agricultural irrigation, water coming in and going out of our homes, yards, and businesses. It is all of us. So the last time a significant number of Americans and Floridians got really engaged in water was well before most of you were born in the early 1970s. Can you read these quotes OK with the light the way it is? No, I'm sorry you can't, because uh, President Nixon is at the top and Governor Rubin Askew is at the bottom. So that was sort of an important point to show the former bipartisan nature of uh, taking care of water. President Nixon is saying, arresting environmental deterioration is of great importance to the quality of life in our country and in our world. That was upon creation of EPA in 1970. <coughs> Governor Askew says in 1971, with creation of the water management districts, we must recognize that the destruction of Florida is a price too high. This was the last time that really a large group of citizens became very engaged in these, these issues. We came together to do something about problems like overpumping and pollution. We created the Clean Water Act, EPA, and other environmental safeguards at the national level. Here in Florida, we created the water management districts to try to rein in unsustainable groundwater pumping and, and again, pollution. But 40 years later, what's really frustrating is that we still haven't been able to change what I've come to see as our key problem, and that is our illusion of water abundance. Despite evidence to the contrary from the suffering springs and rivers of Florida to the shrinking Colorado River, Floridians and Americans still view water as an endless resource. We still flush toilets with the cleanest water that has been treated at our great expense to meet federal drinking water standards. Meanwhile, we send some of our dirtiest water into our rivers where they flow to estuaries. We still pour large amounts of pristine water pumped up from the aquifer onto our lawns. In fact, the lawn is America's largest crop. NASA scientists using satellite imagery have found the nation covered with 63,240 square miles of turf grass which is an area larger than most individual American states. In my, in my book, Blue Revolution, in fact, I call all this turf our 51st state. This turf is mostly watered by pristine, potable water, 
And uh, in, in some cases, more than half of all of our water use is being poured on our green lawns. So the illusion of water abundance is by no means a uniquely American trait. In 17th century France, Louis XIV built some of the greatest water features in the world at the gardens of Versailles, spread along both sides of the mile-long Grand Canal. These sumptuous gardens were home to 1,400 water splendors when Versailles was the seat of French political power. The colossal fountains, pools, grottos, and waterfalls were positioned so the king and his visitors would never lose sight of water during these exhaustive garden tours that lasted from morning until night. But I'm going to tell you something the royal visitors did not know. There actually was not enough water at Versailles to keep all those fountain jets soaring, pools overflowing, and waterfalls cascading. They had been built in careful groups so they could be turned on and off according to the king's progress around the gardens. A secret palace staff would actually scurry ahead of the king's touring parties, signaling his whereabouts with an elaborate system of flags and whistle blasts to convey when it was safe to shut down one group of fountains and turn the next one on. So this is a crazy story, right? Why, why would I tell you this crazy story? I argue that the American illusion of water abundance is that crazy and also carefully maintained. For the past hundred years, the water sector and the largest water users have gotten so good at harnessing water, moving it around cities and regions, and sending polluted water uh, back out again, that modern Americans, just like the visitors to Versailles, never have to think about how it all works. The conveyance of clean water into our cities and the movement of wastewater out was among the great achievements of the 20th century, one that has saved countless lives. But now I argue that that great achievement has become an entitlement. <coughs> water flows from our taps like magic. We enjoy an endless and cheap supply of clean water, and we are more than happy to be absolved of the realities of our wastewater. But the resulting ethos has led to diminished and polluted fresh waters, enormous energy consumption to produce water and move it all around, um, financially unstable utilities, and other problems. And I don't want to dwell on problems this morning because I want to get to the idea of an ethic, but I've just picked one story from North Florida, one story from Central Florida, and one story from South Florida to give you a feel for some of the perennial water woes in our state. Um, this photo is actually uh, Atlanta's Lake Lanier. North Florida gives us the best example of one of our key problems, which is the time and money we spend fighting one another over how to get more and more and more water instead of working together to use less. You may have heard about the legal battle among Florida, Georgia, and Alabama, which we have been fighting for more than 20 years over the Chattahoochee River that leads to our Apalachicola Bay. For my last book, I requested the legal fees spent on this water war. In just the past 10 years, they added up to more than $30 million. That was just legal fees without one drop of help for these rivers. So to me, that is money we've really wasted fighting while the ecosystems of the Chattahoochee and the Apalachicola rivers suffer the losses. Um, Central Florida is one of many examples of Florida's historic over-permitting of water. This photo is from the 2010 freezes where farmers pumped a billion gallons a night from the aquifer to protect their crops. Their freeze protection opened up 140 sinkholes in the plant city 
area under homes, highways, and an elementary school. And I think the important thing about this story is that this was a perfectly legal amount of water. No farmer violated his consumptive use permit. It is simply that Florida's fresh waters have historically been over permitted. <clears throat> Finally, in South Florida, coastal communities facing freshwater scarcity are struggling to figure out costly alternative supplies to bring fresh water in, even as the Everglades plumbing system drains out an average 1.7 billion gallons of fresh water a day just to keep the whole place dry. So, as you know, as I'm sure you've learned in school, the damming, ditching, and draining of the Everglades is sort of Florida's classic example of the unintended consequences rule. We often get excited about infrastructure and new technologies to solve our water problems, only to find in a few years or um, a few decades that it's con created considerable harm for future generations. So the last pressure point I would like to mention is energy. It takes a lot of energy to produce water, and it takes a lot of water to produce energy. Right now, between 10% and 20% of all our energy is spent pumping, treating, heating water, uh, moving it around, which is higher than the amount of electricity we spend powering our computers and the internet. This means Florida's water and energy strategies should be explicitly tied together and both grounded in conservation. That is not yet the case, but it certainly can be if we decide to work together to use less water and less energy over time. Now this picture is Tampa Bay's 25 million gallon a day desalination plant, which is sort of another one of Florida's examples of the unintended consequences rule. The plant was viewed as a remedy for groundwater over pumping, but it was plagued with technical difficulties came in about five years late and about $50 million over budget. But the less foreseen consequences of the plant have been its enormous energy demands and carbon emissions. So, but my favorite part of the Tampa Bay desalination story is that in the years that the Tampa Bay region was waiting for this plant to come online, um, it managed to reduce its groundwater pumping by the amount that the plant was supposed to replace and without one drop of the desalinated water that water officials thought they had to have to reduce that pumping. And that, I could tell you that story from many parts of the country and many parts of the world. We're really using less all the time. So to me, these situations and many others like them make clear that neither water management and government regulation, nor the courts, nor costly technical fixes will be enough on their own to save our fresh waters for future generations and ecosystems. All of those answers have a place, but after my years of reporting on water, the solution that stands out to me is the one that is also the cheapest and the easiest and the one that fulfills our obligation to your generation. And that is this idea of a water ethic for Florida and a water ethic for America. And here, <clears throat> I don't know if you can read this definition, but basically a water ethic means making sure that the way we live with water today doesn't jeopardize fresh, clean water for our children and ecosystems tomorrow. And the roots of this ethic lie with Aldo Leopold, an ecologist and forester who wrote a wonderful book that I recommend to all of you called A Sand County Almanac. Writing in the wake of the Dust Bowl, Aldo Leopold proposed a land ethic and tangible ways, tangible changes in the ways farmers treated soil, rotated their crops, and so on. These were all practices that our nation has come to embrace 
and they are practices that have helped us avoid another dust bowl type disaster in subsequent droughts. So the water ethic is the same. It is not a touchy-feely, intangible idea. Rather, it is a tried and true way of living differently with water to protect our future. So Aldo Leopold defined his land ethic as a community instinct in the making, a shared ethic among everyone who uses land. All of his children grew up to be scientists, and one of them, who was named Luna, grew up to be a leader, a really the father of modern hydrology. Luna built upon his father's idea to call for an ethos for water. He wished foremost that Americans would come to understand their water. So back to that idea of the illusion of water abundance and, and lifting that illusion. But that would not be enough. Luna tried to help people understand that technology could not fix all of our water problems and that indefinite expansion of water supply was not possible. With nature's lessons in mind, he wanted us to find the steady state, that balance point I was talking about, at which our generation doesn't harm the next generation. <clears throat> so Luna articulated this water ethic as a set of guiding beliefs among um, government, large water users, and citizens. And the shared nature is really key. We know that agriculture uses about 40% of our water here in Florida and nationally. So the ethic is much bigger than asking citizens to rethink their lawns. That is part of it, um, but it's much more than that. It's a new way of living with and valuing water in every sector of the economy. So the question, of course, is how do we make that transformation? I've traveled to many different parts of the United States and around the world in search of this water ethic. What does it look like? And I found that countries with a really tangible ethic for water tend to be those historically defined by drought, such as Australia, or by flood, such as the Netherlands, or that otherwise lived under some great water threat. They have in common a citizenry and leadership that is really engaged in water. <clears throat> now the Dutch are very important to Florida because water management here is as much about protecting us from floods as it is about ensuring future water supply. So the Netherlands has perhaps the proudest water engineering history in the world including some of the largest modern dikes and its multi-billion dollar delta works built to keep the populace safe from the North Sea. Dutch engineers assumed that the first climate change threats to face the nation would involve sea level rise, but it turned out they were wrong about that. The first trial was river flooding. The Dutch are experiencing wetter winters and more extreme summer showers. And these changes, along with deforestation and urbanization, mean much more river runoff than ever before. So ironically for the safety-minded Dutch, the intense barricading of the outside meant there was no place for all of that inland water to go but up and over river dikes. So in the 1990s, the country was surprised by three mighty floods of the Rhine and Meuse rivers. One of them forced 250,000 evacuations and caused um, one billion in damage after the country had spent the six billion on those barricades I just showed you to prepare for flooding for the North Sea. So it speaks to the uncertainty of climate change and how we can't engineer our way out of it. Today, the new dangers posed by river flooding along with pollution and other problems have led to this extraordinary turnaround in a country whose history has been defined by building higher and higher dikes. Um, in short, the Dutch are letting in the sea more, more often, reestablishing historic watersheds, tearing down some dikes, 
flooding agricultural land with fair compensation to farmers and restoring wetlands on the grand scale. <clears throat> Australia is another country that now sees water as a great matter of national urgency, and it's a good model for us for possibly drier years to come. I've been interviewing climate scientists for my new book, and while climate models show Florida is likely to see more extreme rains in the future, many of the models also show a trend of less overall rainfall. So in 2000, the Australians entered a drying period that seemed much more severe than any natural drought cycle they had ever seen. The first sign that something was different was that water levels in dams across the continent dropped below 35% capacity, which had been unheard of in previous droughts. Scientists say Australia was feeling the water supply impacts of climate change earlier than the rest of us. And a lot of what you read about the uh, response to what Australians called their big dry does involve desalination plants on the coast and water markets in the agricultural areas. But a really big part of the story, just like in the Netherlands, has been that under the specter of climate change, there's become a great urgency to keep as much water as possible in natural systems, so restoring wetlands, um, managing forests for water supply and returning water to nature as a water supply strategy. Most dramatically, fully one half of Australia's new water is coming from conservation efficiency. So, and that's thanks to a technological revolution, but it's a revolution of tiny technologies. So tiny as in micro irrigation for farms and waterless everything. They have waterless urinals, waterless car washes, even waterless walks in the Chinese restaurants across Australia. <clears throat> so Australia is a particularly good comparison for Americans and for Floridians because we're so much alike. Just 10 years ago, Australians used about the same amount of water as we all do, about 150 gallons a day. Today it is ha a day. Today it is half that. Backyard groundwater wells used to be very common for irrigation. Now that they lived through that big drought, when you talk to Australians, they say we would not pull our precious groundwater out of a hole in the backyard anymore. Almost everyone has switched to rainwater catchment. And although it rains very little, especially compared to Florida, they get what they need and they say they would never go back to pumping their aquifer for lawn watering. San Antonio is another really good case study of a wasteful city that made an absolute turnaround on water. And uh, I don't have time to tell you the whole story, but he, the interesting thing here is that industrial water users made huge changes that, that really spread through different businesses in the community. Um, I met with building supervisors around San Antonio who had slashed their water use by millions of gallons a year with changes as simple as recycling their air conditioning condensate. Every sort of business seemed to be able to get involved with this. Um, a Frito-Lay potato chip plant I toured saved 43 million gallons of water a year and $138,000 a year on its water bill. So this idea of a water ethic is very appealing to the business community once they begin to see how much cheaper it is to live with less water. Anyway, the upshot in San Antonio is that 25 years later, they too are pumping about half the water they used to pump from the Edwards Aquifer. <clears throat> and an interesting thing there too is that colleges and churches were both very involved in spreading the water ethic. And I think the ethic, this is what I'm talking about, it, it, it involves this sort of cultural broadening or democratization. It says that water managers and water lawyers, engineers and environmentalists are no longer enough. Just like in the early 1970s, water now needs the rest of us. 
Um, I have found it interesting that here in Florida, too, we see an increasing number of churches taking up water as a responsibility of faith. So congregations that long worked on clean water projects as an obligation to help the poor in places like Haiti now also work on more practical aspects of water back home. This is Southwest Florida's St. John's Episcopal Church. Parishioners planted this rain garden as a model to show more citizens the importance of capturing rainwater to reduce runoff into Naples Bay. So, so this storm water, all the rain that rushes through our streets following a storm is called storm water. It is a major source of pollution. And this is water that the general public doesn't generally think about. Um, and we also don't think about the wastewater that we flush away. But these are two key parts of the water ethic as well. Green building practices such as rooftops planted with vegetation, many of those developed right here at UCF, and even rain gardens in our yards can soak up 90% of the pollutants in stormwater. Um, the city of, Lant of Atlanta, which people in Florida love to criticize, is developing really progressive stormwater rules including a regional rainwater harvesting program that could produce more than 20 million gallons of water a day, or 16% of Atlanta's net use, which is just amazing. This is just the sort of thing we could be doing in Florida to preserve our water supply, save money, and prepare for a sustainable future. It's all so possible. Instead, here in Florida, we also have been working on cutting edge stormwater rules, but they have been shelved as job killers. In this, you know, they've been victims of the political process, which is really a shame. <clears throat> Earlier in my pre presentation, I showed you those early 70s quotes from President Nixon and Governor Askew on the importance of preserving our environment, and, and I think water really misses those bipartisan days. Um, I think one of the greatest threats to water in Florida in recent years is the intense political acrimony over every single water issue. I find it most painful that Florida's agricultural and environmental communities cannot seem to find common ground. It seems to me that they do have a common interest and that is to keep Florida from paving its last inch. So I, you know, to show you here, I really think the truth is that water is not an issue of more government or less government, of Republicans or Democrats. It truly is an issue of good government. So the idea behind the water ethic is to lift the conversation above politics to try to help people see it as an ethical or even a moral issue. Um, I know the, the panel following mine is water supply, so I wanted to show you my personal pet peeve about water supply planning in Florida. Our planning mechanism is based on this false assumption that we must have more and more and more water all the time to grow our economy and population and this absolutely isn't the case. Our state water plan says we must have 2 billion more gallons a day 25 years from now in order to grow. But actually, we're going in the opposite direction, and we will go in the opposite direction if that's how we plan. Every one of those categories is using less water than it used to. So this would be true only if we live as wastefully in the future as we live today, which I assure you isn't going to happen. Floridians and our farmers, the two largest users of water, are using less and less all the time. And I apologize for this wonky slide, and you probably can't see it, but I wanted to show you how much less we're already using. When I wrote my first book, Floridians used about 174 gallons a day. Five years later, it was 158. Now it's 134. Places that have really worked on this, such as Sarasota County, have gotten it down to well under 80. 
Um, you can see here too that farmers are using less all the time. These are, these are pretty equal uses. We Floridians and <coughs> farmers both use about 40 percent. In 2005, farmers used 2.7 billion gallons a day, and in the last um, count, they used 2.5 billion. So the point is, our water use is going down all the time. We're also reusing more and more water all the time. Orlando is really a showcase of this. Uh, two wastewater facilities here in Orlando helped the city recycle 100% of its wastewater, treated to irrigate 3,000 acres of citrus, 1,400 acres of golf courses, and 2,000 acres of parkland. In the next great breakthrough, we will come to wring water out of sewage and then use what's left to generate energy. A wastewater fr engineer friend of mine puts it this way, the one water that follows the population is wastewater. So when it becomes a completely renewable resource, no region will ever run out. So if anyone is having trouble imagining the day when we elevate water above politics and turn wastewater into energy, I want to take you back to a time not so very long ago. If you could play my video. Um, does anyone, has anyone here seen the show Mad Men before? It's a great show, isn't it? I just want, I hope you can see, this is the handsome Don Draper in the early 1960s. He's a fabulous, successful advertising executive in New York, and you just saw him throw his beer can into the woods. And now I want you to watch what his wife does to clean up their picnic. <clears throat> First she's going to check the kids' hands to make sure they're clean, and now she'll clean up the picnic blanket. Were you able to see that? <laughs> you, so you young people do not remember when people regularly left their picnic detritus at parks and flung their fast food bags out car windows while driving down the highway at top speeds. But mid-century, this is how many American families lived. Research on American littering behavior shows that we are absolutely capable of um, significant ethical change and, and environmental change in just one generation. In 1969, half of all Americans littered. By 2009, it was 15 percent. Drivers included inspired political leadership, private industry buy-in by way of packaging and other changes, successful educational campaigns, and government fines and regulations. But what the littering studies show <laughs> is that what changed the culture more than any other factor was a community-wide judgment about cleanliness. People wanted to live differently. It was an ethic. And so it was only after citizens embraced this ethic that they pressured industry. And this is how things are going to work with water in Florida as well. As just one example, Beverage companies finally eliminated the pull-off tabs that used to be such a problem, but they didn't do that on their own. That was because citizens wanted to live differently. They did not want to see that litter all over anymore. So this is precisely the pressure we're beginning to see in some kinds of agricultural water use. Once citizens become more aware of issues like subsidies that flow to the crops doing the most damage to water supplies. They can influence national policy. We saw that recently in the debate over subsidies for corn ethanol. Um, as I was finishing Blue Revolution, I, I hesitated defining a water ethic because I, I do think every community will build its own ethic based on unique water resources and cultures. It will look different in each place in the same way our farmers markets look different, right, based on local climate and crops. But I did sketch out five common goals with the caveat that these are fluid as Aldo Leopold said, they are to evolve in the minds of the thinking community. And you are the thinking community. I'm sorry you can't see these, but 
I brought a white paper called a, a Water Ethic for Florida. Is, if anyone is interested in that, it's out front. And these are also in the last chapter of my latest book. But um, briefly, Floridians value water from appreciating local streams to being willing to pay an appropriate price for water. Number two, we work together to use less and less rather than fight each other to grab more and more. Three, we try to keep water local to avoid the financial, ecological, and energy costs of long distance transfers. Four, we avoid the two big mistakes of our water history, over tapping natural supplies and over relying on the costliest fixes that bring unintended consequences to future generations. And finally, we leave as much as prudently possible in nature, aquifers, wetlands, and rivers, so that our children and grandchildren, with benefit of time and evolving knowledge, can make their own decisions about water. And I think that's important for you to know. There's a degree of arrogance in making all of these decisions now that will be hard for you to undo. So I hope we leave you some flexibility to deal with these problems in the future. Um, the water ethic will change the way our communities and waters look. More clear springs, less gunk. More meandering streams, less concrete. More green roofs, less asphalt. More shade trees, less open lawn. But ultimately, a water ethic is transformational change. So growing the right crops in the right places, not subsidizing those that are irreparably harming aquifers, reusing water and harvesting rain for irrigation, cooling towers and toilets before we sink the next deepest well, tap the next river, or build the next energy intense desalination plant. Now, since I began this morning with you, the next generation of Floridians, I wanted to also leave you with this ideal this is my own daughter, who is a sixth generation Floridian, and at left she is standing at the stairs that once led to the pool at Kissingen, which is the dead spring I told you all about in the beginning. She looks confounded, I think, because she has never seen a dead spring, and at right is her normal springs pose, which is flight. So that is the picture we want for Florida's future generations and for Florida's water. To me, that is the picture of a water ethic. And again, I think, I think we are beginning and your generation will really get us there. So thank you so much for that and thank you for being here. I have a question about what we should do about our misconceptions of this unlimited water resource because growing up, you know, in elementary school, I remember learning about the water cycle and my teacher telling me that we were drinking the same water as George Washington. And I just thought that was the coolest thing at the moment, but now that I realize how limited our water supply is, like, where do we start? Because I know, I know that our generation still has misconceptions of our water supply. Like, how early should we start teaching our kids about um, how to conserve water and, like, and how do we inspire that generation of kids to be like for ingenuity when it comes to developing technology to clean water? That's a great question. You learned you were drinking George Washington's water and I learned I was drinking the water that the dinosaurs splashed in. So you're right, that makes us feel that there's plenty of water. Water isn't really vanishing from the earth, so how could this be? Um, but to answer your question, one interesting thing I found in both Singapore and the Netherlands was that they had, um, they had museums devoted to water and their water history, and they were bringing kids through there as early as kindergarten. This is just a natural part of growing up in Singapore or the Netherlands, and it, and it is in Australia now too. And I think that will happen here. I think it's already happening. I think... Um, your generation certainly has gotten more freshwater education than my generation did. And we know that children are the nudges, right? Children are the nudges that got us to recycle. I think children probably helped our nation stop littering, and this will be the same. 
my, my concern about it is what, what do we teach them? What would this curriculum be? And, and even with, with some of the water management education, it seems to me that we're often teaching people how to waste water better. Like here's a better way to water your lawn instead of talking about, wow, how could we rethink the American lawn? What, what is a new definition of beauty? So I think it starts very young, and I hope it really is a new way of thinking about water instead of just regurgitating the old ways. Um, well, I was saying, what I was thinking was that the only reason that farmers and people do these kinds of things is because they're allowed to do these things. Mm -hmm. There are laws in place that allow them to do this. And I know there have probably been protests and numerous people complaining to the government, oh, you know, why do you allow this? Why do you do this? But nothing changes. So what would you suggest we do to get them to take this more seriously? Yeah, absolutely. I'll, I'll chime in too. Go ahead. Okay, okay. That's a great question. Um, this is, like I said, this is, le it's been legal use. It's been permitted use. People aren't going around breaking laws most of the time. Um, so the, the issue that I think is so important is that we citizens have become disconnected from water and that's why I love this institute and its focus on civics. There's this water management process and consumptive use permits are issued and when I wrote my first book most people had never heard of what a consumptive use permit even is. And now I really see that changing. I see more Floridians getting interested in what's happening to the water and weighing in on consumptive use permits. So part of, the, part of it is understanding the local government and how the system works. But I think that part of it is also price. Water is very, very cheap. One doesn't pay for one of these consumptive use permits to draw millions or however many gallons from the aquifer. That's a conversation that I think would be interesting for Florida to have. I think we all, if we all had to pay a little bit more for water, I think we would use it more wisely. I think the other thing is you have to understand that Florida came from a core of being a largely agricultural state. So when you look at the reality of the politics, the agricultural body carries a, a large and long-term influence in our state capital. So what can you do? A couple of things. Number one, be involved in the process. It doesn't have to be a protest. Certainly that works. But be involved in the process. You know, every, every person who's in the state legislature in the state of Florida was a high school student probably in the state of Florida, the vast majority, of course. So each and every one of you have that opportunity to get involved in that process, become informed. Each time we have an election, I look at the ballot and we elect all these people for the St. John's Water Management District, which is our water management district. And while you know all about every candidate for every other major office, these people's names are grossly unknown. And they get elected, they get into these offices, nobody knows who they are generally. So get involved, get informed in that process. That, that's, that's what you have to do. But um, so you talked about how in Australia they got, you know, this widespread acceptance of like limited water use and not draining from their aquifers and stuff. How did they, you know, instigate such a widespread, you know, limited use Un of water? <laughs> That's a great question, Ashley. And unfortunately, they had a terrible disaster. And uh, actually, a quite famous scientist in Australia predicted that Perth would be the first major metropolitan area abandoned for lack of fresh water. So this was an absolute, it took a crisis in Australia for people to embrace the water ethic. And so our, our opportunity is that we don't reach a crisis before um, before establishing a water ethic here in Florida. And like I say, this is so doable. We can learn from other parts of the world and from other parts of our own state, and we are beginning to do this. So people often ask me if it's going to take a crisis, and I think climate change is our crisis in that we're seeing, you know, more extreme storms, uh, Hurricane Sandy, the Snowmageddon, the incredible drought, that we've seen in the Midwest. 
Um, so I, I think we are there, and hopefully this ethic will evolve in, in a more um, rational way here, and we won't have to uh, you know, worry about abandoning, uh, abandoning any part of the United States. Um, concerning recent budget cuts, how do you suggest that the United States afford to switch to new technologies or different methods of attaining water? That's a great question, and um, the answer is that the new way of living with water is much cheaper than the old ways of living with water. So just to take one example, we have limited water supply spending in Florida. We could build a desalination plant, which is the most expensive possible way we could get any new water, or we could use a much less part of that money to help farmers switch to micro-irrigation. Many farmers can't make the changes on their own because they live close to the margins, but one thing our water managers have been doing is help them conserve, help fund the technologies so we can use our money to free up water. In, in, it is so much cheaper than our old path to water supply. It, it really is not only the more ethical way to live with water, but it is the more economical way to live with water. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Burnett. Thanks.